wow, there are people who just sit around and practice like six, seven hours a day to do that for their career. That sounds great. I mean, that just sounds amazing. And I, I just remember sitting in the practice room, I was practicing my show band first ballad, and I was staring out the window at this beautiful campus, and I was thinking, I think this is what I want to do. Um, before that, I wasn't really that serious. I was, you know, playing, I played with some orchestras locally, I, I played with uh, Haydn concertos, Mozart concertos, things like that, local competitions. But then it was when I was 14, I was like, this is it, I want to do this. So I started practicing when I got my back, four hours a day. My teacher recognized that I, I should have been studying this more serious than her and very generously referred me to another teacher. And I started working with um, a guy, Julian Martin, who was teaching in DC, but who was also um, teaching at Kiba. Okay, so I, for my last three years of high school, I worked with him. Immediately started practicing three, four hours a day. And something just kind of turned on. And I went to some really inspiring concerts that summer as well. I went to, I heard Rahman Asset Mechanic Concerto for the first time. I heard um, you know, my teacher's be playing these just wonderful masterpieces. Wasn't really interested in contemporary music at this point, really. It was just playing, you know, the, the old war horses, right? So then high school developed more. Uh, I won the National Symphony Orchestra competition. That was the highlights. So I got to play with the big orchestra. That was fun. I played Tchaikovsky and played some Liszt. And then I had that crossroads going to undergrad. What was I going to do? Was I going to pursue a liberal arts degree? Was I going to pursue music all the way? Right? I'm sure many of you guys have grappled with that in different hybrids, different all in, all out, right? I'm sure there's a lot of different diversity in this room. We don't have time to necessarily explore all the details, but I want to at least share my story with you. So essentially, I ended up going to a double degree program in Baltimore. So I was saying Hopkins and Keybody. I was living at Keybody, so I got that whole Peabody experience. I was like, I'm on the conservatory, right? But I still got to do um, a bachelor, bachelor of Arts in English. So I traveled. I didn't really feel like I was much part of the Hopkins community, to be honest, because because I was living right at the conservatory, which is how I wanted it. But I still got to take great classes, English classes, literature, math, other things. And then um, I had a few moments of crisis, and my parents, of course, wanted me to make sure I kept my bases straight, that I had covered you know, something that was more stable. It wasn't music, right? I'm sure you guys know a lot about that. And um, they would wish I had gone to somewhere else, like Columbia or somewhere else, where I could have done music, but not been that serious about it. I had a few moments, um, my teacher, Julie Martin, studied with Leon Fleischer. You guys know Leon Fleischer? Uh, really, really wonderful. One of maybe the best American pianists um, ever. Uh, he's still alive, still playing. He had vocal dystonia at one point. Essentially, his right hand would look like a claw, but it's gradually unfurled, um, and now he can play with both hands again. But so I, I got to play a few master classes for him, and I thought, man, I'm not serious enough. I got to do this more hardcore, like I, all this English stuff. It's not going to work out. I really wanted to do piano. So I, I thought about me going all over Peabody, but never quite made that leap for whatever reason. Still stayed in double degree. Um, did not get into Juilliard for undergrad, but then I applied again at the end of my undergrad and got into my master's. So I did that. I was very excited um, to pursue it now all in, right? So I thought I thought this was really the career that I was going to love to do. And I still, as I'll tell you, I still have an incredible relationship with music. It's very, it's evolved in a lot of ways. But so when I went all into Juilliard, I accompanied people. I started to play a lot more chamber music. Um, throughout my time at Peabody, I'd start to work with a lot more composers. Right? So I'd done this kind of work, which as a pianist, I found really rewarding to play music in my own peers. I started to say, wow, it doesn't have to just be Beethoven or Rachmaninoff. There's all this music that's been happening right now that could be just as inspiring, just as emotional. And a few pieces that struck me in Peabody, I remember very well, were pieces with saxophone. You guys know any saxophone literature? Yes. But what comes to mind when you think saxophone again? Um, what is his name? Boulez? Boulez? Boulez, what's that? Holger? Anyone know any of the saxophone literature? Classical saxophone literature? Glazanov? It's almost like Glazanov. It's kind of a romantic, kind of schmaltzy concerto. Anyone know any stuff? How did they know Bolton? Only Bolton? Yeah. So I, actually, I don't think I brought him Bolton, but I do have some on my computer. Um, and I actually, no, I, did, I did bring some Bolton that I'll share with you. And um, anyone know Albright? Remember that name, William Albright? Um, John Anthony Lennon? These are guys, uh, a lot of them are from Michigan, uh, where there's a really strong saxophone. But uh, for whatever reason, these are the pieces that really spoke to me in terms of contemporary music. There were the pieces that said, wow, this could be just as exciting as inspiring as all this old stuff, right? Getting really serious about contemporary music, went to Juilliard, played a lot of new music, did a lot of uh, accompanying, a lot of chamber music. 
But this, the, just to wrap up the story so we can get into the music itself, shortly after I finished my master's, I, I kind of hit a crisis mode. It was a pretty dark period where I, what I thought I wanted to do for my career the entire time just didn't turn out to be what I thought I wanted, what, what I really wanted. So I was in a place that I was actually surviving in New York. I was a company and I was teaching, I was playing concerts with violinists, I was playing voice lessons, I was traveling to Canada, a little bit in Europe. Um, playing gigs downtown, contemporary music. I was playing um, a fair amount of also standard romantic chamber music. But pretty soon after I got out there, it just turned out that as a career, it wasn't working for me. Um, I still loved music. It wasn't at all that I didn't. I still had the same relationship with piano. But when it became my job, when it was every day, it was every hour, it turned out that it really it wasn't right for me. Now, I'm not at all saying that it won't be right for many of you. I have incredible respect for my colleagues, many of which from Julia are still <laughs> in the music world. There are all sorts of different ways, right? Some of them are extremely entrepreneurial, like Elizabeth, right? If you think about it, this program, you think you guys realize this is the second year it's existed. Um, it's through mostly Elizabeth's efforts, just her own entrepreneurship, her own self-starter aspect, right? So that's something you can really learn from. If you have that personality, if you have that ability, that's extremely useful, right? Because ultimately, no one's really going to just roll out the red carpet just because you go to a fancy school or because you're going It's not just going to happen. You have, you have to kind of make it happen. And many of you guys know this already, right? You have to actually make the connections, make the opportunities, start the record label, start the concert series, right? So that wasn't necessarily me. As much as I love music, that maybe wasn't my personality. So although I was very good at working with people, collaborating, interacting with other musicians, I really didn't have the desire to start a festival or to start a concert series. And that, those things are important, right? So basically, I went through a period where I was still surviving off music, through a variety of things, but then I basically started to transition to another career. And without telling you all the glory details of that, I'm currently a public defender. Okay? I went to law school, I finished law school, I started in Charlotte, and I, I worked as a public defender in Charlotte for three years, and then I just transferred to another office where I started to handle more serious cases. I started to handle some felonies for about two and a half years. I was handling misdemeanors. I love that career. It's great. Okay, it's it's um, has a surprising amount in common with being a performing artist because I have to get up in front of people and perform. Right, and talk, um, to get in front of juries, get in front of judges, convince people. In many ways, being an advocate for a client, which currently is any indigent person charged with a crime, right, is not that different from being an advocate for a composer. <laughs> um, so, not to be that's good around, but it's actually, I'm, I'm, I essentially love being an advocate as a musician, right? So, a lot of what I brought today are pieces by my friends from Julia. Okay, this is a piece by Adam Schoenberg. Anyone know that name? So Adam is a, is a good friend of mine. He's doing really well. Um, he's having big orchestras in Atlanta play his music. This, these are some etudes that he just sent to me that I, I kind of edited and helped him work on a little bit. And I'm about to play these in New Mexico in a few weeks. Um, I'm going to show you some of that. These are pieces by my friend um, Ryan Francis. Is anyone know Ryan Francis? So his name hasn't traveled quite a, enough in my opinion. I think he's Person is also one of my best friends, so I'm biased, but I truly think that he's one of the great um, piano composers of a generation. Okay? And I'm going to show you some of you can see if you agree. Um, this is a piece by Abner Dorman. Do you know Abner Dorman? So he's a little older than I am. He was in a doctorate program at Julia when I was there as a master's student, also doing very well living in California, writes in film music, that's a big premiere at Carnegie. Um, and I got to work with some great people, and, and in many ways, I got to feel like I was their advocate. Right? So they're writing music and I got to bring it to life. I love that. And in some ways, it's continuous. In other ways, my career now is extremely different. Right? So the question is, how have I, how have I stayed involved in music? Well, as a lot, I never really stopped playing piano. I continued to play um, without really any break. But what I did do is I kind of left it professionally a little bit. I still play concerts professionally on occasion. So this summer, I'm playing with the Music Ensemble. I'm playing in New Mexico with the clarinetist. I played with a music group in New Mexico in November. I'm playing these concerts. So I do a few things when I can. But the truth is that my musical career has shifted, it's evolved. What I'm interested in now is a lot more improvisation. So I got really into jazz. I love Keith Jarrett, Brad Meldow, guys like that. You guys know those names? So those, those are real masters, masters of the piano. Um, I got really interested in that area, and I started to essentially do my own improvisation which I do mostly on my own. I don't really do professionally. I play some restaurants here and there, but it's my own exploration. So, so 
what I would say is my own evolution has been very much from being a pianist, which um, in some ways on the most rudimentary way follows a blueprint, right? You guys give me the blueprint, right? You guys have your creative genius, right? You give me some work, and then I follow that blueprint on some level. Now, of course, the great actor, right? A great thespian or a great musician, Richter or uh, Laurence Olivier, they're more than just an architect. They're more than just the contract, right? Right? They're not just realizing the plans. But in some ways, the true creativity is already happened by the time I get it, right? We all know that, right? Like, if you give me something aleatoric or improvisatory, then maybe I'm putting my own stamp on it, right? I'm actually saying, I think this whole section should take twice as long or half as long, or well, why don't, like, when Ryan wrote that piece, Constellations, I was, I was living with him, so I could say, we were roommates, right? So I could say, why don't you think about something really stormy in here, right? That's about as close as I got to actually participating in the compositional process until I left music professional and I started to improvise, right? So I just want you guys to think of it from the point of view of the, the new music pianist, right? I was the new music pianist for a while, which was kind of like a hired gun, right? I can play anything, I've got great chops, give me anything, I'll learn it in a week. But um, not, really, not really necessarily as creative as what you guys do, right? I mean, a great, a great musician, a great performer is still doing something creative, but it's a different element, right? So I, I needed to find my creative outlet ultimately, which involved this other route, which I'm still exploring, which I don't know where it's going to go. But I still love collaborating, I still love playing music. I get inspired, I get excited by my composers because these, these people that I've hung out with for a long time, I can feel that energy, right? And I've, I've been really interested in improving that for a long time. Um, so yeah, so where it is now is some improvisation for me at home, um, playing some gigs, testing myself in the jazz world a little bit, um, trying to find new expression, and then still collaborating with composers and music I really believe in, that I'm really excited about, and bringing that to life. I still find that very exciting. And, and that's all between whatever I can do as a lawyer. But, um, but I feel in many ways more like an artist now than I ever did before, because as you guys know, that creative process of bringing something to life is, is really what motivates, right? Any questions about that? Sorry, Cheryl, I know it takes a while. I'm going to get into music in a second. I know that's pretty personal, but I think it's important to share it. I, the reason I share that is because to really get to the meat of it is that when I went to Juilliard, I kind of thought everything would just kind of happen. It's like, I'm in New York, right? It's all just going to happen. And I think it's important to be aware that that's not the case. Not that many of you won't succeed, because you will, right? And you'll succeed in your own way. And I consider myself to have succeeded in my own way, right? But it's important to recognize that it doesn't have to be the standard thing. Like, you don't have to have Atlanta Symphony and L.A. Phil all commission their music to get a big orchestra, right? It may be starting a festival locally. It may be getting one particular piece that you know is really beautiful to have your friend play it, right? There are many, many different forms of success, right? So just be aware of that. And it, and it may mean that you are a working musician. Like you, you may earn your bread off of music, but then there's this other passion that you also do. Or you may earn your bread off something else, and music becomes a different role, or any kind of combination. You're all creative people, so you can figure that out. Right? I'll leave it at that, but I can be too far. Let's talk about the piano. So I brought a bunch of stuff, and I brought some music. Um, but I thought we'd start, I know we're coming from different backgrounds, so I, what I just told you is all just my own story. But we can't, I can't really share anything with you unless I know some of your backgrounds. I want to hear just, what do you guys think, just throw out some ideas. Play music that involves synthesizers, that involves process things, involves all sorts of different logic, different programming. The truth is I'm not an expert in that. How many people here really use that stuff a lot? So about half, is that fair to say about half? I, I really admire that. I think that's probably the wave of the future. It's just not personally my sound, or, or, and I don't, don't have the expertise. So I'm not going to share something that I don't have the expertise in, right? And you're going to get stuff filtered through my own interests, what music I like, and jazz world a little bit. That's just going to be the nature of it. But um, I want to hear what you, when you guys, when you, you guys think about you coming to a lecture on, what, what is this lecture on? Contemporary piano techniques, what you can do with the piano, what names come to mind? What comes to mind? I mean, Cage. Cage. Who? I don't know that name. You're educating me. Oh, Thomas Hanks. Sure. Okay, sorry. Great. That's definitely. Who else? Liggy? Liggy. Who's that? Who's Sky? I don't know that name. You spell it for me? U S T. Volskaya? B O L S K A Y A. And who is that? She's a Russian composer. Uh, she's dead now, but she, um, well, oh, she's a Russian kind of smooth uh, Shostakovich in that generation. But Great. So we talked about 
Elastic, uh, I played a lot of Snicker, uh, and Shostakovich, who's kind of b before Snicker, right? They overlap somewhat, but. Um, Cage, Addis, Lady, who's told Sky, I don't know about who I'll check out. Ferdinand. Uh, I don't know this. Who's that? Ludovico Ainali. Um, you spell that for me? E I N A U T I. E I N A U T I. Yes. Ferdinand.
Um, what else have I put in there? So, so uh, of course, Cage is one of the central people of this, right? And he actually, and I can play some music for those of you who aren't familiar, but he really specified a whole set of screws and bolts and wooden pieces for it to prepare the piano. That really, that really does really the piano. I mean, it does, it does tie the piano in a much more vile way than some of the stuff, and, um, but creates an amazingly otherworldly sound. What else? Um, using, I mean, this isn't necessarily stuff in the piano, but using other body parts other than your fingers and hands to make the sounds. For example, if you're doing forearms and forearms, they get like huge tones. Or just somebody use their fingers. Yeah, like every yeah. Or you're really flexible. There's the technique where you like hold something down and play other stuff. Okay, right, so kind of the stuff to do with that. So we obviously have a lot of different. Um, techniques that we can get into. So people think about virtual, virtuosity is one of the first ideas that came up. And then we went into extended technique with all these different possible things that you can do. We started with some different names. These are, I guess, we, these names come to mind why? Because they're pioneers, right? They, they did something seminal, something that was, that influenced others, or just had a really interesting kind of command of the piano. Um, who, who are some of your, um, your uh, jazz Right, good. So let's let's think outside of the, the classical box a little bit, right? So um, I just saw someone that comes to mind is really, really um, pioneering. I just saw it in New York was Jason Moran. You guys know Jason Moran? Yeah. So I, I encountered him pretty recently. I didn't know his stuff until recently, so I'm still getting into that. As I told you already, I absolutely love um, Brad Meldow, Keith Jarrett. Um, what makes him avant-garde? Well, when I saw him at the Vanguard, he came out, he kind of, kind of saw, saw him on the stage with like this big camping light, and this really cool camping light, and then there was some music, he was playing this radio. I really like this because I make a lot of recordings at home now with like kind of my iPhone. So I really like this kind of homegrown kind of thing, instead of so refined and so kind of perfectly polished. He came out with this kind of old, like nasty radio looking thing, I was playing some kind of groove. He comes out to the piano, and he has like a tambourine here and some kind of uh, chimes and stuff. And he also plays with not a standard jazz trio. So his jazz trio, he has like a guy, the bass player is way, way more groovy or kind of more R&B influence. And the drummer is just kind of a lot stronger. It's not very delicate. So it doesn't feature him in the same way that some jazz trios would, right? There's way, way more kind of interplay, more noise just across the ensemble. But then he takes this big camping light and he put it on the wall. Who, who's been to Village Vanguard? Yeah, so he put it on the wall and he put, put a shot spotlight on Polonius Monk. And, and then he says, then he just presses a button and he says, this is Polonius Monk tap dancing in the loft scene in New York. So he's, you hear Polonius Monk tap dancing and then he's just starting to mess around with that and groove on top of that. Um, incredible. And the whole group is just kind of playing off of Polonius Monk's tap dancing. So that's a, that, that's a really far out creative idea, to take not just the sound, right, to rip off the sound, but then the actual history and the, and the personality, and to play into that live, but also record it, right? And it was, what I also thought was interesting about that experiment was that he didn't really, um, he didn't really uh, polish it up. Like, he didn't take those speakers and make sure it was, it was sourced through the Village Vanguard correctly, right? He could have done that, right? I didn't have any ideas why. I, I'm still thinking about that. He just kind of took this nasty recorder and just played it from here, and then just kind of jammed on top of it. Any ideas? It's more raw that way, I think. Yeah. So rawness is something that's kind of appealing in today's age, right? Everything gets. I mean, I, I'm just kind of betraying my age here, because I'm older than you guys. But, but, you know, we're a little bit kind of worried or offended by everything getting so refined and so. I'm, I'm afraid of the composer of the, of the next century just being so uh, adept at the computer that all the music is just coming out through this incredible computer program streamlined to the point where it's just a complete technological process, right? Now, of course, the great composers need to find a way to make that human, to make that speak to people, right? But there's that kind of fear. So when he takes this just nasty recorder, it's kind of like, screw this. I don't care, I don't care, about, I don't care about how this really sounds, but right? I just want... I just want you to get the flavor, right? get, get the flavor of this thing, and then I'm just going to play off of it, right? So that was really cool for me, especially because I, I like to just take my iPhone out of home on my upright, which is out of tune, because we move so much, and just start recording and kind of 
see what comes out, right? So there's something nice about that because it's, you really feel like you're participating in that process, right? It's avant-garde also because, partly because when he's playing, he's, he actually, he's doing all sorts of crazy things. He's flapping around. And it sounds way more dissonant than um, your average jazz concert. Now he can also play Fats Waller. I mean, he's playing, he, he was doing a lot of honeysuckle rows and he can play all sorts of stride, um, old style stuff. But he, he's fusing that with much, much more complex stuff. Ornette Coleman, Cecil Taylor, uh, dissonance, right? Um, so I highly recommend it. Another really cool thing before I get off that, that, that he did that was great, is he took this phone conversation of this Turkish woman that he just was at the airport and recorded it. And then he just played back this recording of this woman, just half the conversation. It's called uh, Ringing My Phone. You can check it out on YouTube. And took this Turkish dialogue and then basically did a perfect jazz transcription of that. And then took a particular motive of that conversation, the actual word, and use that as, as the basis for a, a new tune. But who, what, who do you get inspired by? Ellington. Who? Ellington. Ellington? Great. So a little more old school. Still sounds very modern in some ways, right? Yeah. Um, you take like, probably into a kiss or, what's a good example? In a sentimental mood, right? And those are really, really interesting harmonies. Still very fresh. Gil Evans? Gil Evans, right. So tell me more, he, he, he produced some Miles Davis stuff? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. What else? What, what else should I know about? Um, he was a composer and arranger for the Claude Thornhill band. That was like one of the first cool, cool school big bands. Right. Um, he, I, I don't know, I think he's kind of like thought of as like an, an orchestrator for, for jazz and something. He, he, he put like instruments not typical to jazz but then put them into jazz, like oboe, French horn, French horn. tuba. Right, so taking these kind of soft sounds, orchestrating. So I'm not really that great when it comes to orchestration. I play a lot of orchestral piano, but you guys know a lot more about me in terms of sound. I'm very piano-centric. I'm kind of more, I love people like Chopin or Ma, who are just bad and narcissistic about the piano. You know, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really branch out past the piano myself, but you guys have to do that as composers, which is great. I admire it. I mean, that's, it's being more selfless, right? It's getting outside of the piano into other people's language, right? But I've been kind of pretty piano yeah, myself. Uh, Dave Holland Quintet? Okay, I don't know this stuff that well, but I've heard the name. It's like this stuff? It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about improvisational, like their improvising is like off the charts, amazing. Right. They, they, he, they do a lot of group improvisation, and they do it like structure. It's, it's, it's incredible how cool. they, they play off of each other and like do motivic development. Right. It's really neat. Uh, the VJ here? Yeah, okay, so my, my girlfriend just went to a concert of his um, in Chapel Hill. He was playing with the Ice Ensemble. You guys know Ice? Yeah. They, they exploded from a pretty small group in New York, playing a lot of contemporary stuff to, again, actually another flutist entrepreneur, right? Who was who who very um, clever. So I think she just won a, a MacArthur grant. And she, she basically started this group, International Contemporary Ensemble. They play all sorts of stuff. He collaborated with them, did a piece based on the Holy, do you, you guys know what I'm talking about? Indian Holy Day? I can't remember what it's called, right? I mean, Holy? Like what, I think so, I call it, yeah. And I think he actually visited there, there's a cinematographer, they videotaped all sorts of crazy, um, beautiful uh, ritual dancing, and then he came back and wrote a piece that they, they performed. So, so what do you know about Ira? Um, I mean, he kind of does a whole, I mean, look, he, he plays standard jazz sometimes, he's also a composer. Um, he does a lot of like free improv. Right. A lot of like, I heard him do arrangements of like Michael Jackson tunes. Of who? Of like uh, Michael Jackson tunes. Really? Yeah. Cool. I'm really into that. I love it when these jazz guys take um, pop stuff and mess around with it. Like, so Brad Nelda does amazing paranoid Android radiohead transcriptions, like an 18 minute paranoid Android transcription. Um, Keith Jarrett is not good, but Mel does a lot. Of Jason Moran also does that. Uh, Jason Moran has a great rendition of Rollins Intermezzo that you can find where he just gets into this one groove in this really delicate place and just starts repeating it over and over again. It's beautiful. So I'm really interested in those hybrids, those hybrids, those, that, that fusion, right? That's my particular area. Um, and just, just for my mind, what do you guys think about the piano and electronics? What comes to mind? What do you think about the stuff that I was kind of shying away from? Like the synchronisms? Diagnostic? Right. Like maybe like contemporary stuff or like older 
of stuff. Yeah, so that's kind of old for contemporary music, right? But that's definitely the beginning of it, right? So what did we do in that, that would ask you? Good, good. Like one of the original, like I'm not a tech person, I can't describe what it was, but um, you know, he actually had just a very, I'm not sure if it was serious or not, but it was a really hyper strict performance. Everyone knows the right pedal, the damper pedal, right? Essentially just a, a mechanism that lifts all the dampers off the strings, so that notes, they continue to resonate. If anyone wants to get up and walk around, feel free, as I'm showing this stuff here. But the top part of the piano doesn't have any dampers at all, right? Essentially just because these strings don't resonate as long, and um, it's just not necessary. It keeps more resonance at the top of the piano where, where it's necessary, where it's needed. Um, if you look inside the, the instrument, the, the heaviest bass strings have just one, one string per brick. Then you eventually have two and then three. So the left pedal, the soft pedal, see, does everyone know what that does? Shifts it over so it's uh, Right. So on certain pianos, it's, it's, this entire keyboard shifts, the, the hammer strike at a different point in the strings. And end up having either one string or two strings being struck instead of the full three. And because sound is logarithmic, because um, it doesn't cut the volume in half, you end up just having a slight shape of the sound, right? You don't end up having a full reduction. And it creates a more of a muted sound. So
So we have either a middle C that can be held, we have bass notes that can be held. You can also hold um, a certain harmony, pick a, a harmony that you like, and then play around that. And it keeps that part like an organ, but maybe a little bit kind of obnoxious, but you can keep that, that sound in front of the particular harmony and you can keep shifting it. So my friend Ryan uses this really, really well in this first A2. Play around with it, it's tricky because if you, if you start the, the, the damper pedal and then you try to, you're playing something legato. <laughs> Just one thing selected or everything wet. And then 
is modulated to him. Is he a pianist as well? Yes. He so is. did he write that at the piano or something to get those sounds? Good question. So he did a lot of writing on Sibelius. Um, definitely a lot of stuff that's, you guys know Nankuro, Fala Nankuro, player piano stuff? Mm -hmm. That's one of the most notoriously hard stuff. Um, there are people who actually play that music, I've never tried to. But it's designed for the machine of the people who tackle it. Some of the most brutal, what we talked about, just the chorus. <laughs> Um, but he, there's something to play your piano, it's something kind of mechanistic, right? That there's a very mechanical sense of... And it's called digital sustain also.
Do you do you put the little divot on the beat or before the beat? So like, uh, if you are doing, uh, let's say it's four four just common time and you want every single phrase, would you put it on beat one of the the next phrase? And if you want the chord change to be on that, or would it be like just on the down? The down is where the time the, the point comes, right? And then the, the pianist has to figure out those subtle subtleties in terms of where it's actually timed uh, for, to the notes. Um, and then. Usually, sustenuto, what Ryan wrote now is just SP. So catch this thing with sustenuto pedal. Um, catch this particular harmony. It's usually pretty obvious. Um, una corda, you can write UC. And then when you're done with una corda, you can write tre corda, TC. Or you can also just make it more, uh, you know, Americanized. You can just say soft pedal. Um, and then what would you say after soft pedal? Normal. What do you, what do you say? Normal. Normal. Um, the word's not going to come out. Um, yes, yeah, so no, notation is not so important. I just encourage you to mess around with it and play around. But it obviously has to be inspired by whatever your sound world is with what you're going for. Um, you I've heard see it written all out. I put this pedal ad note sometimes. Is that fine? Is yeah, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, because most of you guys want to be trusted with the, their pedals. So unless it's a particular effect, like I would never know to do that, obviously, unless, unless the composer told me to do that. So that's new. So, but, but most of the time, you can trust the pianist, unless there's a very particular sound you can work with. You imagine in a certain kind of dryness. Uh, so, let me deal with um, fingerings. Do I need like we need to like write down like numbers, or do you just figure it out yourself? You don't have to. You don't, you don't need to. Yeah, it's very rare that you see fingerings written in in, in contemporary music. Um, I'm trying to give an example where you specifically say like use this finger. I can't really, a classic fingering issue would be like repeated notes. So I'm working on, um, I just that away. But that, these are really just kind of can of door questions, not really for you guys, because they're more just how to actually play this. This is a really cool piece though. This is like a techno piece that I know. Um, it's called loop. But the reason I brought that up is because there's a lot of fingering issues with this, it's just repeating them. So for those of you who don't know, when you can't play repeated notes, they generally change fingers. Right. You can do it like this, but it's a little bit more uh, clunky. It's usually not right as effective. So usually you can't we'll do 3, 2, 1, or even 4, 3, 2, 1. I'm not that good at that. I'm much better at 2, 1 myself. It's just kind of idiosyncrasy. I just use my index finger on my thumb.
Um, he goes into a really contrapuntal area here as well. I'll have to play a little slower, but. So there's a, there's a metronome marking to give you a sense of just the duration of notes. But it's one of the few pieces I've played that is truly, can you guys all see? It's truly uh, kind of beatless. It doesn't have one of the most fundamental aspects of music. The sense of just... Uh, so it's crazy. Definitely has phrasing. Hopefully it'll, it'll have phrasing. But uh, it doesn't have a pulse, right? It doesn't, it, some of it does, but the pulse kind of wavers in and out. It's, it's almost like a free canvas, you don't hear that. But um, the language and the piano writing here is really, really beautiful, very effective stuff. <laughs>
Very, very interesting um, harmonies. I think he eventually became a little bit more conservative, not quite as far out. I mean, it's very pleasant by the time they dissonant and they're very stringent, right? But he eventually moved away from such complexity with the notation. If you, if you could feel free to come and take a look at it because he notates just every single duration of every note, grace notes, 30 second notes, asymmetrical rhythms, um, pedals. And this, this is a good piece to see how he, write, how he writes the pedal because he has a, his own kind of language. Release pedal gradually with a di diagonal line and then redepress, keeping the E and the B, right? Really choosing what residence he wants. Of course, he could have just left that open and just written it, and it would have been pretty self explanatory. You guys need to play some more stuff, or do you want to, any, any more questions? Kind of one now. Tied to nothing, the tie just kind of yeah. up. Yeah, for example, like I note that this is like, you know, I, I, I play piano and study that it's something I'm not quite sure about backing it, so to figure out how I'm going to do that. I don't think piano would be like that. I do. So I sometimes would do ties and I'll make this like a bass note, pedal through while there's stuff going on. Elsewhere, you can kind of that note and sustain, but the piano C, I think, stops the new note. Very tight, and I think, yeah, usually just implies just continue to resonate, and then the piano's going to kind of use their own judgment in terms of that fading out. Or you can always, always, you can always write words in there. Any other requests? Yeah, I can feel free to come up and take a look. I basically, when I was thinking about this class, I brought the pieces that just kind of strike me as the most creative, interesting uh, just piano pieces that the cool to write. And so I brought the Lenin, because I just love the, the freedom of that. I brought Olcom. This, this piece is a saxophone and piano piece. It's a really neat piece. It, 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 it combines uh, a lot of these inside the piano techniques, also that the saxophone plays into the piano a lot. So this is hard for the pianist, but it, it involves uh, pizzicato inside. So you find the notes, the pianist plays the kind of chord, and then respond with the saxophone is playing inside the piano. You can have a really nice kind of dichotomy between pizzicato and um, on the key playing. This, this is actually all about a demon. This piece is called Le. Anyway, no, Devil's Staircase. Do you guys know these pieces? Yeah. Um, really, really cool stuff. He's combining so many different things that we talked about all in one, which I think is where all the creativity comes from. Right? Just fusion for different things. And this, he has the drumming we talked about. He's mechanics piano's percussion instruments. It's all on the key. He's got um, cross rhythms. Um, related to African drumming, he's got jazz harmonies, uh, not Gila, but Billa. So he actually went on a record being inspired by with, with some of these harmonies that really, they're, they're a little thornier and a little bit more Costco sounding than what you hear in jazz, but the most jazz, but um, combining all different things. <laughs>
inspired by Escher. Uh, the idea that goes off the piano and comes up through the bottom, right? So you go to the top of the piano. Like the staircase, going off the piano and through the bottom. Uh, fractals. Uh, he's written about it. It's really fascinating to hear just about what his interests are, what inspired him. Vertigo. This is maybe one of the hardest ones. Double notes. No pattern at all. Dramatic. Feel free to come up and take a browse through this. But this is becoming one of the seminal kind of new music tones. I brought something way more friendly, which is also really good, by Kevin Putz. He has no Putz. Um, and this is a piece called Alternating Current. has a lot of Baroque figurations in it. Really fun, uh, pleasant stuff of modernized. <laughs>